their communities and Canadian society as a whole. This bill, this bill is, an, is an example of how a drug policy is crafted in the name of protecting young people, while this very legislation results in the increased criminalization of youth. We are having this lobby day to say that you cannot pass Bill C-15 in our name. Bill C-15 contains several, several aggravating factors which automatically increase the minimum sentence for the individual charged. It is clear that many of these aggravating factors are designed to protect youth, but the dangerously vague language in this bill means that youth can often, often can and will be harmed instead of helped. Another provision in this bill that is of concern to us is that individuals will receive a mandatory minimum sentence of two years if the offense is committed in or near a school, on or near school grounds, or in or near any public place usually frequented by persons under the age of 18. This could li literally be anywhere, the street, the mall, McDonald's, movie theater, parks. If it is a place frequented by young people, then it is more young people who, who will be doing time under the mandatory minimum sentences in our already overcrowded jails and prisons. The government is aiming to protect youth with Bill C-15. We recognize and lament that substance abuse among, young, among youth is of great concern in Canadian society, but there is no evidence to show that increasing the potential consequences will have an influence on the decision of young people or anyone else to use, produce, or traffic drugs. This bill and mandatory minimums in general do nothing to address the root causes of use, nor to address the underlying problems of the drug trade that will continue to affect youth if left unaddressed. These are issues that will continue to affect the youth regardless of how much time they spend in prison. The focus on incarceration means that funds and attention are taken away from important systems of support that can help individuals more, meaningful, more meaningfully than two years in prison can. The astronomical financial costs associated with the implementation of Bill C-15 inevitably mean a continued lack of funding for other programs dedicated to the prevention of drug use, treatment of individuals, and reductions of harms related to drug use. These alternatives are better suited than mandatory incarceration in, affecting, in addressing drug-related issues affecting youth. Young people involved <coughs> with drug use need a hand up, not a prison sentence. Incarceration is not an effective way to treat drug use or addiction among young people, or any person with addiction problems for that matter. Several MPs have spoken against mandatory minimum sentences, but continue to applaud Bill C-15 because of its inclusion of drug treatment <coughs> courts as an alternative to mandatory incarceration. While recognizing the important role that treatment can play in deterring crime, we have several concerns with this bill's inclusion of drug treatment courts. Perhaps most importantly for this bill, only six cities have drug treatment courts, and therefore only a select group of people will have the option to participate. Building drug courts in cities that don't currently have one is an expensive process, and drug courts are not viable in rural areas. First and foremost, drug courts cannot be used to justify this bill due to the fact that they are only available to a small number of people, therefore excluding individuals in smaller cities and rural areas. We are also concerned with the results that we have seen from drug treatment courts in Canada so far. The average percentage of people who graduate in Canada is around 10%. The program completion rates evidenced in the evaluations of the Toronto and Vancouver drug treatment courts are unacceptable by any standard of care, including the treatment of high-risk and high-need populations. Evidence shows poor rates of completion for most people with dismal graduation rates, particularly for women. The Winnipeg drug Drug Treatment Court evaluation states that graduation may be biased towards better advantaged people who are, who are of the majority, people who are white, socioeconomically advantaged, and male. While in principle we agree that treatment is a better option than incarceration for individuals struggling with drug use and addiction, the reality of drug treatment courts in Canada leaves a lot to be desired. The dismal results of the program so far show that they have not been as effective as they are made out to be and that they do not present a fair treatment option for everyone. We are pleased that the Bloc and NDP are in, are in opposition to C-15, and we encourage all members of Parliament to vote no to Bill C-15 if they are really interested in protecting youth and working towards a safe, just, and healthy Canadian society. Great. Thank you, Tara. We'll take any questions if there are any. What is the alternative to the C-15, just defeating the bill and keeping the current status quo, or do you have some more long-term ideas? Well, I'll answer first and I'll invite my colleagues to, to answer as well. In our view, there is no need uh, to do anything more uh, to, quote, strengthen the war on drugs. What we need to do is we need to stop Bill C-15 because it's counterproductive and damaging. What we then need to do is actually take a much ca more careful look at current Canadian drug law and policy. We're throwing a lot of money down a hole at the moment with our current approach to dealing with drugs in Canada. The vast majority of our resources, um, according to the Auditor General and in 2003 and according to a more recent assessment, um, are still going toward law enforcement that doesn't lead any significant, tangible, sustained result in reducing drug use or reducing drug-related crime. 
Um, as some of my colleagues have suggested, it would be a much more sensible use of taxpayers' dollars to actually invest in evidence-based treatment programs, evidence-based prevention programs, and evidence-based harm reduction programs rather than spending more money on law enforcement, which hasn't worked to date and holds no reasonable prospect of working in the future. Thank you, Richard. Um, yeah, I, I echo those sentiments. My, uh, my criticism is that uh, Bill C-15 attempts to make drug prohibition work better. And uh, in my view, and in the view of a large body of uh, scholars and evidence that collected in Canada and internationally, drug prohibition does not work. It makes worse what is already problematic. So an attempt to make, like, uh, not to be glib, but to ask what's the alternative to mandatory minimum sentences is, to, is a bit like asking, well, what's the alternative to cancer? I mean, mandatory minimum sentences are just a bad idea across the board. So the alternative is to go back to the evidence, assess it, you know, in a nonpartisan way, and come to a conclusion about the effectiveness of drug prohibition as a strategy across the board. As, as Craig said, prohibition is a failing model, so we're not advocates for prohibition. And we're, we encourage MPs and students as well to come up with creative and courageous alternatives to prohibition. Um, and also, like Richard said, um, we're interested in seeing more evidence-based treatment and harm reduction and drug education programs, but for us it's really important that youth are involved in all of those processes because youth are excluded from this conversation and like I said, this often the drug policy is crafted in the name of protecting youth without actually taking their experiences or their voices into consideration. Uh, prohibition doesn't work. Uh, is it a hint towards, say, uh, put it mildly, expanding LCEO's operations? Well, th there's, there's, a, there's a number of alternatives uh, and that, that is uh, an important but deep and sophisticated conversation, and I'm, I'm happy to, to have that on another occasion, but uh, you, you may know that there's uh, an, ex an experiment, it's, it's reality now, in Portugal, where they have decriminalized across the board, and they've seen rates of use, rates of crime, rates of all problematic behavior associated with drugs plummet, right? Uh, and they haven't had the explosion in use, they haven't had, you know, the, all the fear-mongering that attaches to prohibition in this country hasn't happened. You know, the sky hasn't fallen in Portugal. So, uh, yeah, we have to, I mean, just to take another example, in the United States, the big jurisdictions who made, who, who, who perfected mandatory minimum sentences and who grew their prison populations, you know, out of control, specifically in New York, California, Ohio, Michigan, and Florida, are currently extricating themselves from mandatory minimum sentences because all they did was fill prisons with nonviolent drug users. It's very costly. It doesn't address the demand conditions for drugs. So I, I would love to have that conversation about alternative models of regulation. The way I characterize it is that we already regulate illicit drugs in this country. We regulate illicit drugs by turning them over to the cops and organized crime and saying, you guys fight it out. That's our model of regulation, also known as prohibition. We could not design a more dysfunctional form of regulation if we had to. So from my perspective, anything that takes the profitability out of illicit drug, the illicit drug trade and removes the influence of organized crime is a net benefit. Then we can channel all those resources that Richard was talking about that are currently eaten up by law enforcement into education, research, treatment, and rehabilitation, and harm reduction. And I just want to point out to you that the concepts harm reduction and evidence-based are notably missing from the national anti-drug strategy and all of the policy documents that I've seen relating to this, uh, this legislation. In fact, I read over the Minister of Justice's remarks the other day when he appeared before the committee that we're appearing in front of this afternoon. And when he was asked, where's the evidence, where's the evidence, where's it, he would not speak to the evidence because there is no evidence for mandatory minimum sentences. So what's the alternative? <laughs> Almost anything. Okay. Are there any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.